You know, I have been on a steady march to, uh, to make things um, more hardware-based. And uh, I just, for the first time, found a four-port HDMI switcher that does uh, green, key, green screen and multiple cameras, multiple feeds with transition fader bars and everything. All hardware-based. A lot of the camera switching functionality that we use in Wirecast, all hardware-based for $1,000. Now, when I first started podcasting, the same unit with only two HD, they weren't even HDMI, the, two, the same unit with two HD inputs was $15,000. That sucker now at $1,000, that, like, that might happen next year. I might eventually get that, and then that's gonna be, that is going to be such a, a key piece to replacing the Wirecast machine. Not only that, but also to have something like that on the road would be amazing. Because, you know, I don't know if you guys probably all noticed if you watched the video version, but we used uh, OBS this week, or OBS as they call it. We used OBS uh, to uh, do the live broadcast of uh, Linux Action Show and the live event on an Ubuntu 14.04 uh, System 76 rig. And, uh, you know, we got bit by lip sync issues that were kind of a bummer. And uh, when, when one of the things when you, when, you don't, when you don't do video production that you don't realize is an issue until, you, until someone tells you, and you're like, oh, yeah, obviously that's an issue. But you don't think about it until you do video production. But if you got a box, say a PC, right, and it's got three cameras coming into it, one is a 1080p uh, or a 720p, doesn't matter. But let's, let's just say it's a 720p. One is a 720p Logitech webcam coming in at 30 frames per second exactly, 30 for FPS exact, right? Another camera coming into your rig is an HDMI capture card. That's 1080i, interlaced even, right? And it's coming in at 60 frames per second. Actually, not 60. It's coming in at 59.94 frames per second. And then you've got a desktop shot that's coming from a PC that is a 1080p picture at exactly 29.97 frames per second. And then you've got a chat room shot that is on the same machine as the Wirecast machine that is exactly coming in at 30 frames per second at variable resolution depending on how you size the window. And Wirecast, very intelligently, brings all of this together plus an independent audio source, manages to try to figure out the timing on them the best possible, automatically mixes all of that together and, then, and records it and sends it out. And it is truly black magic because each camera and each device are all operating at different times at different resolutions, at different frame rates, and then at the same time, it's bringing that all together with an audio interface, which is, you know, zero latency, right? So you got USB, which has inherent latency because those web cameras have an H.264 encoder in them, which adds latency, and then you have the bandwidth limitations of the USB bus, right? And then you're, you're also, between that, switching to an HDMI camera, which is sitting on the PCI Express bus, coming in as fast as that HDMI port can blast the data into the PCI Express bus, which is way faster than that USB web camera, and then you have that coming in to a screen cap which is going to be variable based on the CPU load of the machine that's doing the screen cap. And, 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 and it brings it all together so seamlessly that we forget that you have to fight problems like lip sync and issues like that. So when you sit down and use OBS, uh, you know, it, you basically lose seven years of black magic, and you kind of have to manually punch those. Very, those. So, you know, for 15 minutes before we started the live stream, 20 minutes or whatever it was, we're sitting, in, we're sitting there adjusting the millisecond delay, and then... And then asking people and, and production, like Rikai back here at the studio, okay, what did you hear first, the clap or the sound? Did you hear the sound first or did you see the clap first? And then they tell us, and then we adjusted another 10 milliseconds. Can you imagine what an animal you feel like when you're doing that? Versus Wirecast, where you just plug it all in and it just does it all. Wow. Yeah. So, there, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's still a huge gap. So, I'm looking at this hardware mixer that would handle these kinds of things, and $1,000, and I'm exactly. done with a Mac. Right. Woo! I'm excited about that. I think that's going to be a 2016 purchase for JB. That's really exciting. Yeah. Yes, but would Stallman approve of the hardware mixer? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, you could always... So happy hacking. You could hack it, right? So that's cool. Uh, I think Stallman just feels in general... I think that we should all make those businesses fail. Now, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I have a feeling he's probably said that before. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs>
I wanted to see, boy, you know, it's too bad Wimpy's not here today. I know. He's uh, he's probably uh, busy uh, doing Wimpy things, but... Uh, Making those distributions. Yeah. I mean, I, all the or things maybe he he's so busy responding to this ultimate new competition. I don't know if you heard about this. UU Mate is a respin of Ubuntu Mate 1510. Whoa. Only it aims to be better. Better. <laughs> I think we'll let our audience be the judge of that. Yeah, so here's what it does. Uh, and actually, since Wimpy's not here, I'm, I'm going to just say this. I kind of do like these editions, but I'm <laughs> sure, I mean, you could just do it to regular Mate right, install. Right. But uh, the highlights of UU you mate include Google Chrome as the web browser. Right, right, right. You've instantly got Chris right there. Yep, just that. K- yep. and not Chromium, I don't believe it, but it's actually the Chrome, which right. means you're going to be watching them Netflixes. Uh, KDN Live video editor. Now, here's the thing I thought was neat. Peer Guardian, privacy-oriented firewall built in. Wow. That's that not bad, right? Handy. Steam included. Now, Wimpy's got these things with one click away with the welcome screen, yes, so does. it's not yes, a Yes, he does. Sync thing, automatically set up. Hey, I like that. Team viewer remote control software installed and ready to go. Wine 1.7 comp is, is turned on as well as numerous sound effects enabled by default. You know what? Not sure how I feel about that last one. You know one, what? But... If there's Star Trek sounds, I'll do it. Yes, Otherwise, okay. I'm yes. out. <laughs> Star Trek theme or nothing. Yes, there you go. That's that's why I hate the Windows sounds. Yeah, not Star Trek. Yeah, right. So the UU Mate, uh, the UU Mate competition is on. It is fierce. Uh, I don't know. We'll see if maybe Wimpy shows up. Uh, we can get his take on it. I think it's going to be a battle royale. Yeah, with the users as the winners. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's West, man. That's freaking poetic. This is Linux Unplugged, episode 119 for November 17th, 2015. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, episode 119 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly Linux talk show. It's hoping that we don't get blown away by this crazy windstorm. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Now, Wes, it is ridiculous. I've been getting reports from all over the area. And right now, as we're sitting here recording the show, I would not be surprised, honestly, if the power goes out. No, I wouldn't either. That's what I woke up to this morning. So it's really a luxury to have power now. And now here's the great part is the way that video codecs work is there's pretty much no chance we'll be able to save this file if... The recording is live. If the if the power goes out, we'll lose the recording. So it's just going to be the live people. Live stream. You're lucky today. <laughs> All right. Well, coming up on today's episode of Linux Unplugged. Yes, I'm back from Colorado. I went to System 76, and we have a great show planned for you today. And we're going to start with um, something I've been mulling around for a little bit. And maybe sure, true, could be that Alan Jude chat room ping Alan Jude right now. Tell him we're about to uh, talk about Docker. See what he thinks about that. <laughs> So Docker is obviously a phenomenon. In fact, DockerCon just happened, and there's a lot of different people out there that are trying to solve a whole ass ton of issues that we have ran into now that Docker is a thing. And mostly, it's around security issues. There are rampant security problems with Docker containers. In fact, if you look at just Heartbleed, there's still a massive percentage of Docker containers that are vulnerable to Heartbleed. That's embarrassing. We created ourselves a huge mess. We're going to talk about that today on Linux Unplugged. And then, SteamOS is getting off to a rocky start. A lot of bad reviews. Ars Technica has said it is the worst performer out there. Is SteamOS doomed, or maybe have they gotten it a little wrong? And then last but not least, our Mumble Room is going to check in with their report on using OpenSUSE Leap for a few weeks. We're going to get it straight from the horse's mouth. we got a whole flock of horses. Is that what you call Lovely, them? lovely flock of horses. Is that you call a bunch of horses? Well, that's what we call them. A flock? Yep. Is that right? Nope. I don't Not at all. So. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about that in today's episode of Linux Unplugged. So let's bring in that virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. 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 Oh, jeez. Oh, Holy crap. Hello. All right. Everybody stop pinging Alan in the chat room. Okay. That's ridiculous. You guys did a that great is, job. That Maybe is, too that's good. too much. Alan, we're sorry. We're sorry, Alan. I love you. I'm sorry. Double tech snap tomorrow. All right. So uh, coming up. Uh, all right. So, all right. So I, coming up now, we got to talk about Docker because this is... Uh, I'm I, I'm not I don't want to have one of these episodes where we kind of uh, rant and rave too much, but it is getting ridiculous, you guys. I I mean my inner curmudgeon is screaming these days. Guys, yeah. what what you like that? You like that my curmudgeon is screaming? <laughs> That's what half the people yeah. are here for. Yeah, I know, right? They want to hear it. Uh, and uh, so let's start with a couple of uh, big news items. Uh, the daddy of Debian uh, is joining the unstoppable Docker crusade. Ian Murdoch has joined the Linux container shop Docker. He founded. Debian in 1993. He led the project for three years during its birth, and he's taken up a position as a member of Docker's technical staff. Story number one. And I illustrate that story to just give you an idea of the hype surrounding this Docker thing. The momentum that has, really. Yeah. Thank you. And now, story number two, starting today from the CoreOS project, which we've talked about a lot on Linux Unplugged. They have launched Claire. 
Declare is an open source tool for monitoring container security. Now, uh, you go, oh, that seems like a good idea, right? Probably want to monitor your Yes, sec- it does. Sure. I like monitoring security. Is my security secure? I don't know. You got to have good I security. I need Claire. Exactly. You got to have clarity. Ooh, yes. Oh. They should so, hire you on to do jingles. Yeah, they totally should. Core OS says that over eight, now, I'm not, I'm not making this up. 80% of Docker images are still vulnerable to the Harpy, Heartbleed bug. Bug. Jeez. Hello. You can't even say it. That's, how, that's how vulnerable Harp, you are. Heartbleed bug. Heartbleed. And this, you know, I don't, even, I, I don't even have to say it, but honestly. This is egregious. It is disgusting. And I can see how this would happen. Yep. As somebody who, who's a little lazy. You know, never. I, I have a couple of Docker images laying around that I honestly haven't updated since the first day I deployed yep. them. I think that happens a, a lot. A lot, a lot. And, and here we are deploying Docker like crazy, just like we've deployed home routers and all of these other little Internet of Things devices that we don't actually you have. You don't know how they work, and so you don't even bother. You don't even think about it. Right. In fact, the whole appeal to Docker is, well, it's a static environment you that doesn't break. You don't have to peek break. inside. You, it just works. Yeah. They've configured it for you. I can update my host OS, right. but the static little container doesn't change. That's the whole appeal to Docker, yes, it is. right? Which is another way of saying, this is this little area of my machine I'm never going to update. Yep. That's what you're saying. Is your, I'm not worried about it. It does what it does. And, and it becomes a deployment methodology. Right. It becomes a way to manage risk. Right. You never hear about making Docker containers. You just hear about downloading them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or keeping them up to date. And I mm-hmm. wonder, like, uh, how, what what's the plan here? What are we going to do here? And it feels like uh, everybody is is scrambling to come up with, uh, with an answer to this problem. And in fact, even Docker themselves, uh, they are looking at this particular issue. Docker has added a hardware signing feature. You ready for this? You remember how you were saying about buying one of these? Yes, I was. YubiKey. Hey. YubiKey. A device that we all are very familiar with here on the show. And this is whether their solution. Docker has already implemented the update framework, a method of confirming that a digital signature applied to a container image in a repository matches the signature of code arriving at the enterprise's Docker system. So they finally have signing. This is good. This is good. Now, YubiKey, uh, uh, with YubiKey 4, this is where you could have two-factor authentication that requires the device to recognize the user's fingerprint before we'll issue the identification. I don't quite understand how they're going to work this in. But Docker, this happened to DockerCon, they announced a new layer in code and identify a confirming process. Developers and system administrators can use a keychain, like a keychain fob, like like the like the YubiKey four. It's got to be the YubiKey four. It cannot be an earlier version. Plugged into the USB port on a laptop or a workstation to upload their unique identifier to the container and authenticate. As the code moves along its journey to a production system, the identifier continually ensures the recipient that only the identified hands have touched the code. So it verifies the entire chain, and at the end with the YubiKey. Pretty fascinating stuff. But what, so uh, one of the demos from DockerCon um, was that the developer had a, a set of private keys that were generated from a, a root YubiKey in the developer's shop. Um, the developer then decided in their wisdom to commit those private keys to the public GitHub oh, joy. as a backup. Right? Yeah, that yeah, was sure. the demo. So what they showed in the demo was that with the YubiKey, they were able to rotate the master keys and um, turn off those developers' private keys, and therefore huh. make it in so that he wasn't able to push to no kidding. The, um, the hub just by rotating those keys. So, some really nice features. Um, also, they they announced something called Project Nautilus, um, and that was, uh, I think, the reason that CoreOS have open sourced Claire. So, ah, you think it was a response oh. to Nautilus? I, I reckon they knew about it and thought, right, we've wasted all this time. Let's just make it open source. <laughs> I'm not a cynic, I promise. Um, so, what, can you describe uh, a little project, bit? About, could you do? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, what Project Nautilus does is it um, it gives you a very cool dashboard, um, and it analyzes the layers and it does static binary analysis in each Docker container. Okay. Um, so it'll look at the, the version of curl that you've got, the version of OpenSSL, hmm. and it'll say against a, a vulnerability database that, that Docker maintain themselves. They were quite hazy on these details, which are obviously very important when it comes to security. But um, they maintain this database themselves of vulnerabilities. Um, and what they were saying to me earlier was that if uh, there's a, a vulnerability in upstream for example, and that's the container I've based off of. What that will then happen as a child um, c- 
container, uh, I will get a notification saying, hey, your container is now vulnerable because of this upstream vulnerability. It's okay, we fixed it, but you now need to um, kick uh-huh. off a new build on your, or of your course, machine. Right. Yeah, yeah, you would. So it's 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 not gonna it's not gonna automatically fix the eighty percent of images which are yeah. vulnerable. vulnerable, right? But it's a good start. So I'm just yeah. gonna drop a link into the chat. Thank of you. The Thank you. Interface. Yeah, I put it in the IRC too if you're logged in because that'd be really handy. What'd you find there, Wes? What's that? You you digging around on that? Oh, there you are. You're digging around on it right now. Yeah. Yes, I am. Cool. Yeah, I'll put a link to this in the chat room too. That is actually really good to hear. And thank you. You know what? That is. It's really. It is really kismet on the timing there that yes. he went to DockerCon and that's showed perfect. Up. It really is perfect. And this is what I love about our virtual lug. If you go to a conference or an event like this, or even your lug, and want to come and share with our lug, we would love that. Yeah, we would. Yeah, we really would. Yeah, I'm so, sat in my hotel room in Barcelona waiting for my flight tomorrow, and well, I had nothing better to do. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank we you. really appreciate it. <laughs> really, we really do, because, you know, it was in Spain this year, and uh, we were just talking a little bit ago. Uh, it's going to be in uh, Seattle in 2016, uh, on June 20th to the 21st, and I'm already kind of thinking, yeah, no, we should. Or, no, why do I do that, dude? I'm I sorry. Don't know. Wes and I. After, I take it as a compliment. After, I like about, a, after about a year, uh, I'll we'll, get it. We'll get it right. Yeah. Uh, Wes and I, I really think Wes and I are going to uh, go to this. If you can get it from work. Yes, like, absolutely. Absolutely. You think? I, well, I think uh, yeah. whatever, six months is uh, plenty of time to June 20th that. through the 21st in Seattle. Maybe you can come meet Wes and I, and uh, we'll go down there and walk around and uh, go to DockerCon. But, you know, this year it was in Spain, so it was not very practical no, for us to go. Very, I mean, I like Spain. But. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for going there and uh, giving us kind of the report on that. That is, that is pretty cool. And it is, yeah, I was thinking um, back on, on why I started using Scale Engine to host Jupiter Broadcasting. Oh, yeah. And uh, so it started as I was just the, the thing about a podcast is like certain sometimes certain episodes are very popular. And so all of a sudden you have a huge spike in CPU and bandwidth and all of that. Right. Transfer. And uh, at times that you probably can't really predict. Right. And so uh, I was kept getting screwed. Like just like this is this is before DigitalOcean. I just right. kept getting so screwed. When you paid by, for a fixed amount of money. Yeah, and even get paid for CPU usage. Right. And so, you know, Alan came along and. I remember at the time thinking his pricing was unbelievable. Like, how could it be so low? Like, what is he like? He, can, he, can he really deliver? Is this over and, and you know how he did it? Is jails. Because he could, give you, he could give you metal performance at really low cost to him. Right. He didn't have to spin up a virtual environment, an entire operating Wasn't system for that, overhead. that emulates virtual hardware or, or tries to hyper, use a hypervisor that translates between physical and virtual hardware. Like, he just did a jail. And he just had us, you know, and it, uh, honestly, it's the same exact thing that makes Docker so appealing right. to Linux users is you can create a Docker container and it is an isolated environment, right? And all of these things. So you want to have a certain version of PHP? Have that at Haas. You can have your specific Doesn't version. Conflict. Of PHP. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So that I remember now, honestly, though, FreeBSD had that years oh, they ago. Had it. Yeah, it's been it's and so stable. What Docker did, though. And this is, and I think, a, such an important thing for us us to understand. And I think it's, if you're curious about this at all, when uh, what Docker did is they closed that 10%. And I like to say this on other shows, you know, they closed the uncanny valley. You know, in 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 in, uh, in CG, they have the uncanny valley right. on like movies, where like you can kind of tell it's CG, but it's like really it's a close. Little too, it makes you, it's just freaky. Yes, it's weird. It makes right? you uncomfortable. Yeah, it does totally. And that's the uncanny valley. That is the difference between. Where uh, where jails was and Docker Maybe is Maybe zones, slash zones. Yes, get that too. totally, absolutely, it does. And so Docker closed that uncanny valley, uncanny valley with that like GitHub like approach of right. publishing images, having it a very central... fits in today's de- yes. deployment development culture. And that was all it took, right? Just just like uh, Apple famously will, will ever, oh my gosh, it's so revolutionary what Apple's doing. When in reality, like us nerds are like. Dude, other people have been doing that for years, right? They just right? put the pieces together at exactly. the right, right time. And, and a lot of us nerds are like, well, I'll put the pieces together myself. Right. <laughs> and it's no big deal. <laughs> but they will close that gap. And that's what Docker did. And so container technology was was uh, was not totally new. I mean, even even uh, even Cheroot environments existed under Linux and LXE containers. Exi- but Docker came along and just put it all together in this yep. nice package. And uh, the problem with that is, is it also made it way more accessible. And way more deployable. And so you got guys like me who go deploy smoke ping Don't Docker really containers. Don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. What this? This Linux thing doesn't. You know, I go deploy a, I go deploy a smoke ping Docker container, and then I don't touch it for a year. 
Right. And now it's sitting out there. Living there on the public yeah. public facing. Yes. And so that that I, I don't know where to take this. And I, I wonder, Wes, do you figure is this one of these issues that just sort of sorts itself out over time or is this are we what I worry about is will Linux become known as the platform that hosts a bunch of outdated shit? Right. What do you think? I mean, in some senses we are already. Right. I right. mean, there, there 80, are those communities. Eighty percent yes. of Docker containers are vulnerable to Heartbleed that have open SSL. I think there's a lot of enterprises that are working on removing, you know, a lot of older Debian hosts in particular, older oh, Ubuntu yeah. installations. Yeah. Right. And you get stuck on these things. Um, same true with Windows. Though. Same. Same as yes. Very so much it's so. not just like a Linux the, problem. Uh, Windows three my, one that uh, brought down France my, last week. My work runs Oracle. My work runs Oracle Linux five, and they want to use Docker. Just wow. To, wow. Oracle yeah. Linux 5 would be what? Based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5, I guess? Which would be three versions yeah. old now? Which would be almost seven years, I think? I don't know exactly. Yep. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is really something. Uh, I do think, though, that there's been a lot of very good attention recently, just both in Linux community and, and in Docker, uh, you know, that... That we need to have at least. It's you an, can't force it's, what people it's definitely do. An issue they're taking seriously. Exactly. They they, de- they devoted at least at least half their sessions today to security. So yeah. They're they're aware of it. They, they're on it. I think it will take time. I yeah. think we also have community players like CoreOS in particular that really do take security and very they are seriously. Pushing Docker. Right. They're pushing Docker. They're pu- pushing containerization. Yeah. But I think they're doing it in a very open an open way. But in and helping you know provide the community tools yeah. that they can use. Yeah. It's actually the it is a great example of how you can have legitimate competition in the open source world, but yet every freaking buddy is benefiting. Yep. And I I I look at uh, this and I think, man, I wish more people were current on this issue. I wish more people knew all the nuances and were following this because this is such a brilliant example of how open source can be competitive yet cooperative at the same time. Yes. And in such an area that's so critical to the future cloud, quote unquote, Right. right. I feel like right now we're kind of shaping what the next yeah. you know, 10 years of, of deployed code will look like. Yeah, I agree. All right. So uh, uh, before we move on to well, some feedback, any other uh, thoughts? Yeah, go sorry, ahead. I'll- Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, what, one other cool thing that came across was um, uh, I saw a demo today of someone sharing the X11 socket from inside a, a Linux OS to inside the container. And with that, oh. they were able to run whichever desktop application they wanted Wow! in a Docker container. That's nice. And then where they took that was they then they, they clicked a button and they launched uh, a whole Eclipse IDE environment in a browser. <laughs> it sounds like maybe in the future we could have something like Cubes OS, but with right. like Docker or LXC yeah. instead of yeah. Zen. Huh. Huh. That is kind of like that. Now, that is uh, that is uh, web computing. Uh, all right. I just wanted to point out before we move in uh, to the rest of the show, we went to System76 this week. Had that a, was a lot of fun, it looked like. Yeah. Had a blast. Had a challenges. Um, I forgot the most important piece of equipment that we could have, for, you know, I mean, there's not a more critical piece of equipment I forgot. That was awesome. Uh, I stayed in a hotel room that felt like a palace. That was pretty cool. And I got to play with an augmented reality sandbox. That was awesome. Uh, so check out Roverlog. Uh, check out the Roverlog episode 15 of my trip to System 76. It was a freaking blast. Uh, Colorado is... Sounds like you got some walking in too, Chris. Uh, Wes... I'm not. I didn't. So you're put, feeling healthier. I did than not ever, put this. I, Wes, I did not put this in the video. But uh, there was a night where I legitimately went, laid down in bed, had to put a pillow under my knees, and my all of my legs ached. And I thought to myself, 380 bucks a night, and I all I want right now is a freaking bathtub. Uh, <laughs> it was it oh, no was, bathtub. <laughs> it was just so bad. It was so bad. I hurt so bad because we walked around so much. Here, I'll play the first uh, few seconds of the Roverlog. I want you to go check out Roverlog 15 though. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. That, oh, I don't hear. It. Hold it's on. Mostly Chris talking yeah. about how nice the hotel is. Yeah. <laughs> that's like eighty percent. It is, but it's worth. It's great. It's, it's, it's great. A, it is definitely at least a solid thirty percent. I don't know about eighty, but yeah, check out the intro here. We're here in Denver, Colorado, to go to System Seventy Six. It's their super fan contest, and we're gonna go in there and see what they have to show us. Let's go. So they had a whole steam room set up, which was super, super nice. 
bet you were getting plenty fine performance in that room. Yeah, it was really cool. And they had a whiteboard paint up so you could draw and stuff on there. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, it was really cool. Uh, so Rover Log 15, um, it literally was down to the wire to get that episode of Linux Action Show. And uh, you can find out more by watching episode 15 of the Rover Log. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com to find that. You know, you can also find a few other things over at Jupiter Broadcasting. But uh, so that trip... It was it was so funny. We're sitting there just having a nice casual conversation, and I can't even remember how it came up, but uh, it comes up that you know Noah switched a few people to Linux, right? And just a hobby, really. And Emma's sitting there. She's an employee of System Seventy Six, and uh, I love Emma. She's been a longtime friend of the show, and uh, she says, "Oh, I switch more people to Linux than you do." Old. And, and mind you, this is our first day there. And we're still kind of doing that 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 phase where like I know you professionally, I, I followed everything you do. But you don't quite know where the like human boundaries yes, are, exactly. how to connect on that level. Within thirty seconds of that conversation starting, there was four F bombs dropped. <laughs> like it was on. Wow. It was, yes. This got human. <laughs> it did it got these two, Emma and Noah, like take switching people to Linux. So seriously, thank God those people are out there though. And and it was she threw down like I had mad respect. And so she came on the Linux Action Show and we talked about that a little bit. And her and Noah are going to have a massive competition. I don't know what I don't know how Noah's going to do this because he's also in the process of moving. Right. You know, and he like runs a business. He's got something like that. He runs his own business. He's got two kids. Right. Yeah, two kids, and he's gonna. uh, They're gonna move. (laughs) They are moving houses right now. But he he couldn't help himself. He throws down with this competition. And so what I love about it is over on the subreddit, there was a thread started by uh, Rusin88, uh, Noah versus Dr. Emma, switching people to Linux, the competition rules. There's already 14 comments, and it's heated. It is passionate. <laughs> it is so funny. So if you want to throw down on what your idea should be around this competition between and, – and I, I – you know, both of these people – they legitimately switch people to Linux all the time. Uh, like the, if you you don't know until you've been with Noah. But I went to I went to a burger place with Noah. I went to go get a I went to go get a bacon cheeseburger and some fries. I feel like you're like the embarrassed wife in this situation. Yeah. We're like, no, not right now. Just I, we're just trying to have dinner, I, please. I am I am I am an advocate for the Linux platform. Right. We are standing in line at Five Guys getting a burger and fries, and Noah is switching this dude to Linux, and he's like, here, <laughs> take this thumb drive, go install this. Like, and this guy's like, all right, I'm gonna do it, and like. <laughs> Before we order our burger, Linux uh, Noah has this guy switching to Linux, and That's and so amazing. yeah, it was it was so good, and to see those two go at it was so great. And if you haven't watched this week's episode of Linux Action Show, you, you got to go watch it. It was a really funny throwdown. So we're gonna have a competition coming up, and I really actually do legitimately want Rose because I have to play judge. Yes, I got to judge this thing, and I need to know arbitrator what, Chris. I got to determine what the parameters are. So we have a link in the show notes if you I think guys this might warrant like a Teespring shirt or something. Oh. Ooh, yeah. Noah it, the switcher. It, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. And, and Emma the closer. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> That's good, Wes. <laughs> yeah. We should really make something out of this. And, you know, uh, if we had more time, because we were just there for a couple yeah, of days. Right. If we had more time, I would have just, we would have gone out down on the street, down a man on the street kind of thing, and just had them start switching. Because both of them, and think about, like, the like the social norms you have to completely reject to do what they do. They they literally walk up to strangers and start profiting to them. Have you considered changing your operating system? Can I tell you about your savior Linux. Yeah, like, right, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And so, and it is so much fun to watch. Switcher versus Closer. You guys got to go uh, watch this week's episode of Linux Action Show to see what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, before we move on, uh, because there's so much to cover this week, I want to talk about DigitalOcean. I love DigitalOcean. They always have come in at, at just the perfect moment. You can get started in less than 55 seconds to build your own Linux rig with one click deployment or really fine tuning it. And think about that. 55 seconds. I mean, you can't even get a live CD booted in 55 seconds. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month. You can't even get a burger for $5. And this is $5 a month. A month for a Linux rig up in the cloud with a crazy fast connection. They'll get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. But what I love about DigitalOcean is their availability of locations. They got a brand new one in Toronto. That's called the FU NSA Data Center. But they also have a great one in Germany. They have ones in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and even London. But it's that interface. It's that interface. It is so good. It is so intuitive. And it doesn't suck. Like, it lets you do snapshots. It lets you destroy machines. It lets you transfer between virtual servers. It lets you one-click deploy applications in a Docker container. 
It doesn't suck. And they have a straightforward API that makes it totally usable. And because that API rocks, there is a crap ton. I mean, like, a, a crap ton of really good open source code that makes you look like a pro you can go take advantage of right now. You can just go grab it right now. You can integrate it in with your smartphone, integrate it in with your toolbar, get a GNOME extension up in that biz. I don't care. There's tons of code. It's all about enabling you, right? Like, between that and all of the tutorials, which cover, like, Oh, I mean, they're so relevant. Even if you aren't using DigitalOcean, I mean, Shh, you can, that's the dirty secret. That's the dirty secret it right is, there. It is so good because, like, you know, you're just deploying standard Linux distributions. It's Ubuntu, the new Fedora, Arch Wiki, really. It really is, dude. Don't tell and them that. It is good because the the thing they have, uh, you know, kind of against, you know, like I don't mean to knock on the Arch Wiki because, dude, I go to it all the time, but they pay the people, right? Right? They pay you to write up tutorials, and then they have full time editors. On staff, and you know, little side story here. And by the way, I haven't said this yet. Yet I probably should have because it, this is the only way this show survives. Do unplugged. Probably should have said it at the beginning because D-O if you don't, unplugged. Do unplugged. One word, lowercase. If you don't use that uh, promo code, the show doesn't go on. So I probably should have said that at the beginning. But I'm just I get excited. So you know, I look at this and I think, Wes, imagine what we've been talking about. We've been talking about Docker. You know, we've been talking about deploying things. There are ways to use Docker that are smart. And what I, you and I before the before the show, we were talking about a Python thing that you're working on mm-hmm. to to take some like an extra bit of work you've gotten and kind of parse it all up and put it in a spot for you that's easy to read and it's using this Java intermediary. It's just like this long, complicated yes. thing you're doing, right? Yes. And I I look at that and I think, geez, you you know, once you've developed that, if you did all that in a Docker container, it's like one, two, three clicks. At uh, uh, actually, they're not clicks. It would be I'm looking at the command four commands to yep. have this deployed on a Docker container. And just boom, you have, you have this up on you go and you, then you create the DigitalOcean droplet, and then one command after that, and you have it running on a production. Everything's deployed. Yeah, it's just going. So in four commands, you've got it. You've got it containerized. You've got it ready to go. Publish up to the Docker Hub, and then one command after that, you've got it deployed on your DigitalOcean droplet. That sounds really nice. I mean, that is a huge appeal. That is, it is really something. And it, or you know, there's a bunch of other stuff you can take advantage of. Just go try something, like frickin' own cloud. Sync thing? Sync thing, yeah. Definitely sync thing. Definitely sync thing. Just go try something like that. A Minecraft, go to your own Minecraft server, Mumble server. There are, uh, MB. there yep. are so many different ways I use Docker, I mean, Docker and DigitalOcean. And, 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 and MB is running in a Docker container on a Fedora 23 DigitalOcean droplet right now. Wow. Yeah. It really can't get easier than that. <laughs> right? But it's, that's it, how I'm rolling But it's the days. good kind of easy where you know that it's stable. Here's how it's, I did it, It's too. production grade. So in 55 seconds, I deployed a Fedora 23 uh, DigitalOcean droplet. Then I installed Cockpit, oh, which was it. one DNF command on the command line using the HTML5 console that DigitalOcean gives me. And then I logged into my, into my Cockpit instance, and in there they have a whole container section, and I just inst- I deployed MB. So I, I, I deploy Fedora 23 doc, uh, droplet, install Docker, install Cockpit, one-click deployment of MB. So you could, like, give this job to interns, your assist, you know, whoever. You can just well, get it done. And now I'm like, so there's things that happen. I'm like, you know, I'll just log into my droplet, get this show on MB, and I just watch it in the rover. It is That's amazing. It is amazing. And you can use the promo code DOMplug to get started. Just go check it out, and you support the show. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code DOMplug. I mean, it is a Linux rig up in the cloud, crazy fast access, SSDs throughout. I mean, you can figure it out. Go do it. DigitalOcean.com. Try it out and make something awesome because hashtag just saying. Just saying. Okay. So on November 10th, Steam Machines hit the uh, hit the internets, went out, and people started getting their really super awesome, you know, design for gaming, Steam Machines. And as always, people got to do their reviews. They got to do their benchmarks. We're going here. Yeah. You know what? Uh, before we get into this, I, I should do the official opening of our segment. Yeah, <clears throat> there we go. That's better. And according to ours, the uh, the takeaway here is that uh, cross-platform 3D games face a 21 to 58 percent frame rate dip. Ouch! I don't like those numbers. Chris. No, on the same exact hardware, you're dual booting between Windows and Steam OS. 58 percent drop. It is, it is what you might call, Wes, I don't know, devastating. Devastating. And it's co- sort of confusing. You like, that, you like that DF command in the background there? Yeah, that is look nice. At that. Yeah, at, least at, they're, at least they're doing the Linux part right. Yeah, I appreciate too, that. Too bad it's like retrying and crap like that. It's, 
Yeah. So uh, to start their test, they dragged out a dual boot DMOS Windows machine. This is on ours. They built two years ago, so it's a little old, and but not that bad, and got all the uh, OSs up to date on both sides. They ran a whole bunch of tests. What and was the, uh, did they have, I know they had a lot of graphics cards, but. What was the specific graphics card that they used on this particular rig? Yeah, I'm just curious. Is that is that what you were asking me right I, that's now? That's exactly what I'm asking. Are you asking me that right now? Uh, I believe it go was. Go on, an, go on. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's a good question. Actually, I believe it was an Nvidia card, but I don't actually think they listed it here. Okay, just because that's a. Oh, they did. I'm sorry. I'm a dummy. Uh, it was the uh, GTX 660. Are you serious? <laughs> with the uh, drive with the Nvidia driver 35891. Now, are you is essing that me? Current? Are you, that's a really good question. So here are you on I'm the not bo- sure. on the Bonobo. No, it's not current at all. Uh, on the Bonobo, let's see here. I, I am on three fifty five because I haven't updated for like two weeks. But uh, I'm trying to figure out what is my um, what's the what's the video card in this Bonobo? Because it's 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 a G four. So they basically tested it on a machine that is less powerful than my Bonobo, and my Bonobo is three years old. I it's still a, impressive that Windows was able to. I have a 680M, so. uh, the dude. I have a 680M in my three-year-old Bonobo, and they're sitting here. You know, can I just take a second? I mean, it's we'll happening, get in, folks. We'll get into the rest of this as we go, but I sure as shit would never come on air. I would never, in a million years, come on air and and dare to tell you the performance of games under Windows or Linux with such shit hardware. I wouldn't dare do it because I would be torn apart by my audience because they're smart. Yep. They're not a bunch of dumbasses. A sick, that is re- I, I cannot believe ours published this just on the, okay, anyways, but that's not what we, that's not the takeaway because the numbers are what matter, but it is, it is literally, if you're gonna, if, if you're gonna be Ars Technica and you're gonna make this huge ass publishing, you're gonna do this huge ass article, if some podcaster wouldn't even bother doing this because his hardware's so out of date, you gotta think about that. Give that some thought. I mean, that is, yeah, right? It's a little, I don't, I'm, I don't know. Like, like, uh, Install the latest driver, at least, if you're going to use that hardware, which... Wait, are these the stats on the side here? That's the hardware. That's the hardware there, yeah. That they're using? Yeah, Windows 10. What is the CPU there? It's a Haswell, uh, 3 gigahertz. Does that say Pentium? G3, two, will you look up the G3220? It's the G3220. Uh, but it, but like like R. Brown is... Uh, uh, R. Brown, go ahead. You, you, st- you, 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 you don't have to say in the chat. You're in the mumble room. Go ahead. Make your point. Yeah, well, um, the... The thing I was thinking, though, is like if they're using hardware that's old, I mean, surely all of the effort, all of the optimization for these Linux drivers are, are targeting newer hardware. I mean, I've definitely seen it with some of the older NVIDIA stuff. They just drop that support completely out of the Linux driver sooner or later. So if <laughs> ours have gone back and used an ancient card, yeah, maybe it does suck compared to Windows, but I'd like it to see with like a, a relatively recent one. Yeah, 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 I agree. So what'd you find? Well... I will say that the the list, the recommended customer price for the CPU box, well, for the tray, which is the more expensive, yeah, sixty four dollars. Oh, so it's definitely a <laughs> bargain basement. I mean, and all of this, it still remains the point. Like, why is Windows performing better? Right, that is what it's still totally relevant. It's just kind of surprising. It is. I feel like I saw other reviews where they're like, oh yeah, we bought the newest Skylake, and mm-hmm. here we were trying. Mm-hmm. But it feels like if Chris went and scrapped together a few spare parts in the JB uh, One right. Studio and then did a Steam OS review. That would be bullshit, and my 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 viewers would think I was a I was an, an uneducated idiot. If and I, I got when I was reading it, I just assumed that like okay, they bought like the Alienware or the you right. know, like one of the commercial options, well, and they installed Windows. I, I was gonna say was the reason why I went with this because the fact of the matter I was gonna say was it doesn't really what matters was how the difference performance delta right. was between the two right. OSs, and, and that is important. still the case. But like our Brown is saying is it very well could be that the newer GPUs uh, so specifically. I mean, that was, that's been three and a half years. NVIDIA has changed its tune about Linux right. considerably in three and a half years. SteamOS was announced since and then. Not that it's relevant to this review, but I'm sure the same thing would apply for AMD, you know, given their recent turn totally. events, right? Absolutely. Uh, but here is the devastating part. And, it, and honestly, it, 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 what really, what is really, uh, what is really disappointing and uh, it's really too bad. They're fools. Is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because Ars Technica is saying SteamOS is slower. So let me tell you what they're saying about SteamOS. That is actually the takeaway. All that matters, unfortunately, in 2015 is somebody scrolled past that headline on their smartphone. 
And that is the reality of they were They were thinking about getting Linux. They were thinking about buying a Steam machine. And yeah. now they're like, well, no, I'll just build another so Windows gaming rig. This this did surprise me. Um, Valve's own Source Engine games showed the same performance hit when compared to their Windows versions. Portal, Team Fortress 2, and Dota 2 all took massive frame rate dips on SteamOS compared to their Windows counterparts. Only Left 4 Dead 2 showed comparable performance, comparable performance between Windows and Linux. That's pretty devastating. There was no indication of the frame rate perform- uh, improvements that Valve cited a few years ago. That is a little bit of a bummer. Uh, right now, it seems like choosing SteamOS, this is according to ours, this is their wrap-up, choosing, choosing SteamOS over Windows Box means sacrificing a significant amount of performance on many, if not most, graphically intensive 3D games. That's a pretty big cost to bear, R says, considering that Alienware sells its Windows-powered console-style alpha boxes at prices that are only $50 more expensive than identically outfitted SteamOS machines. That's not to mention the fact that Steam on Windows currently has thousands of games that aren't even available on SteamOS, including most AAA recent releases. While SteamOS has similar exclusives to recommend over Windows, hopefully Valve and other Linux developers continue to improve SteamOS performance to the point where high-end games will be expected to at least run as comparably between Linux and Windows. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. That's not how you want your first launch to go. What do you think? Or is, uh, is this a problem, or is this just, is this sort of like how a early generation thing goes and the consumer market understands, or? It's not great. I mean, I feel like we're still in the waiting phase to see how all of the Steam launch stuff plays out. You know, maybe after a quarter, we'll see kind of what are the retail, you know, how many how many were picked up, how many people did actually buy them, especially over the holiday period. But it is disappointing that we can't come out the gate and say, like, even especially on titles where Valve has, you know, ramped up support, that we can't say, like, look, you can play them on Linux and it's just as good. We can't even say that. And I want to add a little context to this conversation. Um, Fedor, Fedor developer, GNOME developer, he, I think he works on GStreamer, um, Christian Scaler, he writes, uh, for us in the Linux community, these machines are more than that. They're an important part of helping us break into a broader market by paving the way for even more games and more big budget games coming to our platform. Playing computer games is not just a niche. It's a mainstream activity these days. And not having access to games on our platform has cost us quite a few users and potential contributors over the years. I agree. I agree with that, yeah. I have, an ins- I have, for instance, met a lot of computer science students who ended up not using Linux as the main OS during their studies simply due to the lack of games on the platform. This is really big. I think this is a really accurate point. Instead, Linux got deregulated to that thing in a VM, and you only needed it when you had to have that assignment to complete. That does kind yeah, of ring right? true, doesn't it? I mean, it? You, I've, I've, I've met those people. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, and it's not against them. It's like... Windows is the operating system that works. You don't question it. Well, Linux is your development you know, thing. You, you know, so you, you know. Let's say you got, you know, you got. Uh, let's say you got five hundred dollars slosh a month, and you got it. You know, you save up a couple of months and you buy a thousand dollar laptop. Well, now that laptop not only is the way you're getting your schoolwork done, but that's how you're getting your gaming done. Right. Maybe it has Optimus graphics. Maybe right. you know all of these like little that, things. That is literally all that matters. Is that it took you two, three months just to afford this thing or to make the payments on this thing, it better be able to play games. And if that's the difference between Windows and Linux, you're going to go Windows. And it came, it probably came with a Windows license. You know. yeah, I was talking to a student uh, at System76, one of the super fans, and she said that uh, she was running Linux because she was in computer engineering, but gaming wasn't a big issue for her. Right. And so it wasn't. It wasn't. On those cases, it's easy, right? Right. And but for she said, for, you know, other students, that's the that's the number one differentiator. And that was just a couple of days ago. Somebody told me that that's in school right now. So that actually really rings extremely true for me. Uh, he goes on to say, mem- remember, he works on uh, G Streamer. He's a developer. Um, uh, Which I, I gotta say, G Streamer's been doing some pretty impressive stuff. I don't yeah. know if you've seen that, but I have been following that. I'm very very excited about that. I mean, this was on uh, blogs.gnome.org. He says, Steam for Linux and SteamOS can be an important pieces of break. Through this, Steam OS and Steam machines are also important for the Linux community for another reason. They can help funnel more resources from hardware companies into Linux drivers and support. I know, for instance, that all three major GPU vendors have increased their Linux drivers' investments due to Steam OS. Also rings right. true. Yep. This is why Steam OS is important. And the success of Steam OS is also kind of important. He says, by the way, uh, side note, uh, also working on a few features in Fedora Workstation to make it better for Steam and Steam games. This includes our work on the GL Dispatch and Optimus support, as covered in a previous blog, which we'll have linked in the show notes, and lib 
R-A-T bag? <laughs> Lib rat bag, I oh, okay. believe. <laughs> That's how I'm saying it anyway. <laughs> that is how you say it. Uh, is a new library for handling gaming mice on their Linux to make it <laughs> even better. And then finally, they're working on Bug64 to make it even better to host the Steam client related to the C++ ABI issues. I'm glad that they've gotten the sort now because I don't want to deal with that. Do you think it's uh, important, Steam OS, Steam gaming? Really, honestly, do you think it's important? I think that the last point there about putting stress yes. to develop more. I mean, like we see it, you know, obviously like Pixar and the, and the, the really industry specific things are doing it, but they have so much stuff that they end up replicating themselves or, you know, building stacks to do their high end stuff on Linux. I think we need more of that consumer spectrum to be pushed and developed. And obviously we have a lot of big changes coming with Wayland and Vulkan and all of that. Vulkan's so we'll, a huge So one. we'll see where that goes, right? Yeah. But I think it's important even now to begin putting that stress on there and be like, Linux is perfect. We've seen it in other industries. Right. And, if, we, and if we can get more of that, maybe getting gaming companies to see that they can take Linux and shape it into what they want. Really what we have to do is we have to bet that Windows continues to suck balls. Yes. And then that makes them want something else. And that the store threatens gaming yes. industries. Right, you know, right. That kind of stuff. In fact, it'd be good for Linux in some ways in gaming if the Microsoft Store did kind of well. Too bad it sucks so bad. Yes. Uh, right. And then you're right. if Because they could do this. They could push on and they go, oh, man, this is why we need Vulkan. This is why we got to support Vulkan. This is why we're getting behind Vulkan. Right. And this could be really good in the long Because the thing about Linux is, like, you know, if, you, if you're focused on your product, you can take Linux and you can build yeah. it to just do that. You can make it excellent. Yeah. Uh, Mumble Room, any thoughts on this particular topic on Steam Machines or Vulkan or gaming under Linux or maybe why ours got it wrong? The floor is open. I'll give you a couple of seconds to jump in if anybody wants to. I yes, I, I, I got one. Yeah, go um, ahead. So I was actually looking at these numbers here, and I did mention in the chat room earlier, any number over 60 frames per second is literally going to be imperceivable uh, to the human eye. Um, any number over 30, you're going to have a hard time. Um, I'm seeing here for most of these numbers here on the Ars Technical article, uh, Linux still performs over 30 frames per second. So for most people, you're not going to have a uh, perception problem there. Right. The other, thing that, point. the other thing that Ars should have done, and this is why I wanted to talk about this, I wanted to do a little debunking, is they should have benchmarked all of these at 1920 by 1080 because that's the highest resolution a SteamOS machine is running at. Right. And, and if you think about that, 1920 by 1080 is a really easy benchmark. Now, a 6680, uh, 660 and a 680, they should be able to do that no problem. They should be able to do that at 30 frames per second, no problem. 1920 right. by 1080 is not a big deal. And everything should have been baseline to that. They did, uh, they did a couple of different resolutions. Uh, one of them was uh, 1792 by 1120. Not ideal for gaming. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a great point, right? Because the SteamOS machines only have to push at the max that your crappy HDTV can do that you bought on sale. I will also say that the article, it touches on it and it does mention it, but I feel like there wasn't enough emphasis placed on what's the end user experience? Like, can you buy this or run this and have a enjoyable gaming experience right. for a you know a large yeah. selection of the games yeah, that because you can a, use? I mean, a Steam machine is about that living room big picture right. experience. And a Windows Steam machine is about that, that traditional Steam client experience sitting at the desk. Right. Gaming. Right. And if you're the user that spends $2,000 and buys a custom, you know, makes a custom gaming rig, that's a different marketplace than mm -hmm. like, I spent $400 at the store and I want to be able to play, you know, last year to maybe this yeah. year's titles at reasonable settings. Yeah. Wimpy, you wanted to jump in on the Vulcan point. Yeah. So if you look at the um, demonstrations that have been done demoing games using OpenGL and Vulcan to show the performance increase, on Linux, you typically see um, OpenGL performance sort of uh, I.O. bound to a single thread on a single CPU core. Mm -hmm. And then when you see the same title switch to Vulkan, you see that workload spread across all the cores and the load come down and the frame rate go up significantly. So while I don't want to appear an apologist's, apologist for Linux's performance versus Windows in this case, I think we need to have one eye on the future and that future is Vulkan. And that does perform very nicely yeah. uh, with yep. Steam. Yeah, I agree. I actually agree a lot. Uh, I, wonder if, I wonder if we'll start to see you know, Vulcan ship in 26. I don't know when we're going to actually start to see it as end users. I'm so excited just for Vulcan and Wayland and yeah. and both of those together as the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So when Vulcan launches, does this mean we're going to all have to get new hardware as well? Maybe, although I, f I guess current hardware Sorry, today. I that. What was that? <coughs> um, I know something. Yeah, go ahead. I think today current hardware does support it, but go ahead. 
I believe uh, the GTX 5, uh, 500 series and above will support it. Uh-huh. And then um, the newer R series AMD graphics may support it. Okay. okay. So, so at least some of it. How about the HD 4000 for Intel? Intel, I believe there are already drivers being built, but I don't know about Intel's, unfortunately. Huh. I, I am imagining. Yeah, I'd imagine they make that work, but it is, it, it is funny. I don't feel like we have for for specifically for in this area, we have never really been to a point where we've been like, well, next year or in two years. Like, there's a lot of times in Linux where we do say, well, soon it's going to be a lot better, or GNOME's going to yes, get this, right. or the Linux kernel or system. You know, all this stuff we keep saying is going to be, but this legitimately is is actually happening, and there's a lot of interested parties, and it legitimately is going to change things, and I'm very excited about it. I am very excited about it. So it, and and this R Technic article, what it really did, is it it under it underscores the need for Vulcan and why we want this. Right. But what Wes so so very very acutely pointed out that if even in the lowest conditions, you know, you're getting 61 frames per second, you're probably going to be okay on a console. Right. Uh, hooked up to your HD television that may or may not even support 60 frames per second, and so uh, that's really the market. For SteamOS, I also have to say it's pretty cool that, that here we are in a widely read publication that ours is. You know, they're yeah. they're they're talking about like here's the graphs, here's like a a widely deployed thing, and Linux is yeah. front and center. Yeah. I mean, it's SteamOS, right? But right. Linux is always rebranded. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that is actually also something to kind of take away from this. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Rikai, by, by, by the way, is touching in on the Intel thing. Uh, in the chat room, he says, developed and showcased a Linux driver for Intel, which enabled Vulkan compatibility on the HD 4000 series integrated graphics. So, uh, there you go. So, you got back to the 500 series of the NVIDIA cards and the 4000 series of Intel graphics. That's pretty good ways. That is pretty yeah. damn good for Vulkan. That is really good. So, when that actually uh, starts to make more sense and it's something you might actually see on your machine, we're going to talk a lot more about it and why it's a big deal. But right now, I'm going to talk about Linux Academy, because that is a big deal and a sponsor of the Linux Unplugged show and a great opportunity for you. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged to get our discount and to support the show. Keep us on the air. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. They got step-by-step video courses, comprehensive study guides. But what I think is really, really, really cool, you can jump in, you know, you can start training yourself, you can use your own time, be your own boss, learn on your own schedule, and then if you get stuck... They got instructor help. And that is really nice because these instructors are super bright. They are a bunch of Linux and open source enthusiasts, and they have decided, well, let's create a training platform. What a brilliant freaking idea. What a brilliant freaking idea. Genius. Why didn't all, like, look at, look, I'm not even, I shouldn't even say it. Look at freaking Linda, right? What a yep. joke. What a joke compared to Linux Academy. Their courseware is a joke. They are an embarrassment. Go to Linux Academy and see the difference when you have people that are actually passionate about Linux. People that know what Vulkan is and Docker is and the difference between Linux and a kernel and a distribution. Like, uh, maybe they know what the GNU tools are. That would be a great thing to know if you're going to start writing course material. So so imagine people that are so crazy passionate about Linux that they get the stupid idea to go create a website to train people how to use it. And that's where you start with Linux Academy. But instead of being dumb about it, they're like, well, all right, let's pair with educators. Let's pair with developers. Let's pair with indif- industry professionals. Let's build something unique, create a platform. And you can tell they eat their own dog food, right? Like, they use Linux yes. every day. It's oh, like yeah. It's I, so I, tied into I, this. I, 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 frequently, I frequently communicate with the guy that runs a Linux Academy, and trust me, he is a diehard Linux user. And, and what is so brilliant about what they have done is they have taken something that is so often a checkbox, a feature on right. all of the other training platforms, and they have, they have created an entire platform out of that. Virtual servers on demand, you have SSH access to, DNS makes it super easy to log into. They can choose from seven plus distribution, so you know your 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 virtual server matches that, your courseware matches that. You can buy like you can be like listener Ryan and and totally get all of your downloadable comprehensive study guides and listen to them while you're in the shower, or Seth does in the shower. I mean, there are different ways, or or while you're driving, instructor help available on demand. They actually know what the hell they're talking about. They're watching the open source development and they're saying, okay, this is something we need to start creating courseware. 
courseware from. They had courseware on Docker before you knew what Docker was. The Linux Academy is tuned in and passionate about this stuff. That is that uncanny valley that I talk about. They close that gap. I want you to go there and try them up because they're always getting better, adding new courseware, including new features. Man, in October, it was crazy with all the stuff they rolled out. And they have some really good stuff, including real-time progress checking, some great professional development courses, better expanded nuggets, including, including, oh, man, the live events have been so great because you can just sit there, you can be stuck on something, ask them the questions, and then get the answers. And then if you get, like, a little bit of down, you know, we're not doing so good, the community stacked full of Jupiter Broadcasting community yeah, members. Yeah, we're the best. So, you know. I agree. I agree. Very encouraging. I really do. And, uh, you know, they also have uh, all the stuff sort of attached to Linux. Uh, AWS and all of like you know Nginx and Python and Ruby and all that kind of stuff. I like, think that AWS one is really big too because that's one thing you see a lot. Mm-hmm. Enterprises love yes. AWS, right? Yeah. But it's kind of the More pricing structure is a little confusing, especially yeah. if you're like a small end person yes. or just trying to learn it at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Linux Academy completely controls that cost for they you. They manage all of it for you. Right? It's amazing. It's just part of the subscription. You go to linuxacademy.com slash unplug. They just roll it right in there. The virtual machines they spin up, if they're on AWS, if they're on their own infrastructure, doesn't matter. They're honey badger. Man, they just take care of it for you, and you get whatever distro you chose at the beginning of your course. That's the system you get. It makes a ton of sense. Even if you want to get into Android stuff. And then last but not least, if you're ready to go get those Red Hat certifications. You know, there are the few certifications after all of my years in the IT industry that I feel this the Cisco certs and the Red Hat certs that make people go, what? Oh, you actually got that? Oh. You know what you're talking about. Yeah. Those are the certs, right? Right. Man. They have so many great courses on the Red Hat stuff. It is part of their bread and butter. And they, I get a lot of great emails from people that have gone there, taken the Red Hat stuff, and gotten the certifications. It's kind of becoming the one go-to link. You know, people are like, what do I, how do I learn Linux? I'm really interested, but what mm-hmm. do I do? You're like, mm-hmm. Linux Academy, Linux man. Linux Academy. Just check it out. Check it out. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. Get our awesome discount. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. LinuxAcademy.com slash Unplugged. All right, Wes, are you ready to? Uh, oh, and by the way, a uh, special mention to uh, the uh, the bad news about for like ours. Bad is, news. The bad news about Steam machines is spreading. Like it does have some impact. Um, uh, VentureBeat has a story about how uh, Falcon PC is. This one hits uh, close to home too. I know they've canceled uh. their Steam machine. They've canceled it. Falcon Northwest and a yeah. an Oregon company. Yeah, yeah. Oh, literally cuts. Yeah, oh, right, see, right. That, that does it, it. It hurts, Wes. It hurts. So. Uh, it is having some impact, you know, the bad press is, you know, we talk about it from like, oh, this isn't good. Well, it actually is making a bit of a difference, at least. Um, so, yeah, we'll have links to all of that stuff, all that shenanigans in the show notes if uh, you guys want to go read about that. But I want to shift gears for a moment and uh, have a chance for our uh, listeners in the Muppet Room to jump in. I, we Last week we said, well, uh, let's kind of get an idea of how Tumbleweed is uh, landing amongst the audience. So we put a call out there and said, if you've been running Tumbleweed and want to come on this her show... Give us your ideas. And so here we are, one week later, and we've got a good assembly here in our room. And we've even got a good thread going in the Linux Action Show subreddit, uh, electrical uh, electrician, electrical magnician. <laughs> how do you say How do you say that? Electrician? I'm, I'm not sure. But regardless, <laughs> the feedback's great. You sound like an idiot. Electromagician. Oh. That's me. That's me. <laughs> There you go. But there's no M in there. I know. No, you just got to you gotta emphasize the... Uh, Electric... I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to give up. No, you, what you can do is you double down on that G. All right. So he says, just checked in on the latest episode of Linux Unplugged and was stoked to see a segment on my distro of choice. And we have uh, 26 comments coming in on this thread. And uh, I, I'm actually kind of excited to say... Uh, uh, I want to start with Mr. Brown, R. Brown, from the FSUSA project, kind of get an idea of how Leap has been received from the end users, and then uh, jump in from the rest of the Mumble Room there. So, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, tell me about, uh, what are we, two weeks, three weeks in from the Leap release? I can't remember now. What's the reception been? Any gotchas, any surprises, and any uh, interesting tidbits to share with us? Yeah, it's been it's been 14 days. It's been really good, actually. So, I mean, this is all a bit of an experiment for us, you know, treading new ground, mm-hmm. mixing an enterprise distro with a community one and the feedback's been great the community has been really receptive lots of people trying it lots of good feedback lots of good feedback from the press i haven't read a bad review yet oh i know now, now oh. i've said that someone's gonna write one right but, right. You know. <laughs> right yeah so uh you know uh, 14 days into it is not too long but um has anything sort of caught you by surprise, uh, or or has anything already kind of been like, oh, okay, we're going to have to address this? Any kind of like, um, might have to shift strategy here? Real life adjustments. 
yeah, um, it's been interesting with like the feedback with like uh, our choice of versions for things like Gnome and KDE, where like there's some people who are really happy with KDE 5.4 in there. Some would prefer to have KDE 4. Mm. Some are wondering like when are you going to have 5.5? There's that whole question of like how fast are we going to move that stuff? Yeah. Um, and and I haven't got a straight answer for it. I mean, the, it, there's there's so many different moving parts of like how fast will the base system move? How much does the community want to maintain it? How much do we replace in the base system? All that kind of fun stuff. So that that's going to be you know a good discussion point for forty two point two. Same goes for for GNOME. I mean, we had a lot of feedback of like, why did you guys put three sixteen in there instead of three eighteen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, three. Yeah, everybody wants the latest and greatest GNOME. I think. Always, always. Yeah. Uh, uh, very good. So, Gabriel, I know I've been watching you in the subreddit for a while now. I know you've been a uh, user of OpenSUSE and jumped on the leap uh, since the beta milestone. Uh, so what have been your impressions, Gabriel? Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, my impression is very good. I've started from beta, and I saw the review you made uh, on the show. A few few weeks ago. It yeah. Was, yeah. Yes, it was uh, very good. I've tried uh, both KD and uh, GNOME. Hmm. On KD, just a couple of freeze at the beginning, but after the first few updates, everything was uh, very good. And GNOME is good too, so I'm pretty happy. As you know, from uh, everybody knows, I am a supporter of OpenSUSE, so I like it very much. I'm using it uh, since uh, one year ago. Probably this is the reason why, for me, um, Leap is awesome. Hmm. So, uh, and and what is the what's the main thing about Leap that's awesome? The stability. I like the idea of having a project that uh, has a professional maintained uh, core, plus a community that uh, is giving uh, the. Let me say new things. It's not as new as Tumble Windows or Arch, but it is new. Yeah, yeah. And Tyler, you've yeah, also, Tyler, uh, also oh, uh, Gabriel, I think you got an open mic there. Uh, Tyler, you've been using Leap for a past uh, week and so. Uh, what are your thoughts on the KDE version? Uh, so far, I've been really enjoying Plasma Five. Uh, I've had a couple issues I've run into. There are things about Plasma Five that still feel a bit incomplete compared to Four. And I did actually have an issue where an update actually made the uh, policy kit quite restrictive on the desktop. Oh, that's a little troubling. Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, so after an update, I had an issue where the policy kit would not allow the uh, applets to, let's say, go check for updates, or I couldn't uh, just use the applet to change my network. I actually had to go and change the policy kit myself to allow myself to do that. Uh, hmm. Huh, that is that is probably... Those are the things you don't... Might be a bug, might be a bug. Wimpy, uh, you've been running Leap for the last week. Tell me about that. Yeah, I installed uh, Leap on my test machine, which is a fairly old ThinkPad T61P. Mm. Um, and I found a lot about Leap to like. Um, I particularly like the way the default uh, installer sets up the disk partitioning with the root file system using a rather complex structure of um, uh, B3FS subvolumes. Oh, and right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very impressive and what they do by default. <laughs> yes. XFS. Yeah. I think that's a really smart move. And I imagine is what is powering uh, Snap. Is it Snapper? Uh, yeah, the tool Snapper. Yeah. Underneath the hood? So as you do your um, package installs and package updates, you get these snapshots before and after, and you can hack and what have you. So I, I really like those features. I think that's very elegantly integrated. Installed the KDE version, as I know traditionally KDE has sort of been the desktop, the showcase desktop for OpenSUSE. And uh, I haven't really uh, run KDE much, and I really like the way that that's presented in OpenSUSE hmm. because, from my point of view, it's a very sane, usable um, KDE setup. You know, it's instantly familiar, uh, usable, and un that. And I ran into a few sort of things that made me look at it, you know, 
sideways a couple of times, but nothing, you know, nothing awful or horrible. I was really very impressed. I thought it was uh, quite elegant. Huh. Now, uh, um, Heavens asks a good question. I want to come back to this for a second. But Barbara Wobble in the chat room says he's been using Leap on his home server with a few Docker containers running Debbie and Jesse in the container. Nice. And he's happy with it so far. He says that one of the nice things is that the NCurse's interface to Yast makes it great for headless. Yes, but I here's, love that. Yes, I really do, too. Uh, here's Heavens' question. And I'm wondering if anybody in the mumble room has any thoughts on this. And maybe, Wimpy, I can start with you. Uh uh, how would you say, uh, Wimpy, how would you say Leap is for brand new users, like new or newish users to Linux? Uh, do you think it's a suitable desktop OS? Once it's installed, it is. But um, if you've got to install it yourself, maybe not. Hmm. Why do you say that? Um, well, for, for somebody that's familiar with um, Linux installers, then you're not going to have any difficulty with this. It's, okay. it's going to be largely familiar. But, but the, uh, for example, when I um, started the install, I've got uh, Intel Wireless something. I forget what model of chipset. But in the installer, the Intel firmware for the wireless chipset's not available. So it, it sort of nags you that the firmware isn't available. So I just sort of, you know, skip by that and ignore it. Ah. Um, but then... That's strange on a four gig ISO that the firmware is not available in the live session. But then when you've installed the OS, the firmware is clearly there because the Wi-Fi works uh -huh. perfectly mm. uh -huh. post install. But some of some of the way you navigate through the installer isn't super intuitive. You know, if you've not done a Linux install before, I think you'd feel a bit out of your depth if you've done any mm. sort of Linux install. I, I think I would agree with that. You'd I would be comfortable with it. I would say that even just I was trying to download it earlier in the week and it took a good like three click throughs to get to a page where I could actually download it easily off the SUSE website as well, which was a little like you if you're dedicated, if you want to do this, it's fine. But yeah, it's not like the one click uh, link. Yeah. Yeah. That makes we, sense. We, we fixed that. It's oh, OK. Two clicks. That's okay. perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Two, two clicks is much better. Yes. <laughs> I can handle two. Yeah, uh, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think thirty-three percent less clicking. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Makes the difference. Thirty-three percent less matters. Uh, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that uh, actually stops some people from downloading. It might have, I suppose, in the past. Just because I'm used to like Ubuntu, right? It's like right on the screen. You're like, oh, click, it downloads. Great. So, Kitson, you uh, you kind of like the installer, though, don't you? I like the installer. I've always liked the OpenSUSE uh, installer. Uh, I've actually found the Ubuntu installers and whatnot to be too simplistic, <laughs> and some of their options I've noticed have been dangerous. For instance, let's say you have an existing LVM encrypted setup on a disk and you don't want to wipe it. With Ubuntu, too bad. You're probably going mm. to uh, have that wiped. With OpenSUSE, I could set that up. I could give it the password. It'll mount it. I could say I want to wipe this partition and that partition, but I want to leave everything else the same. And I think that that's a big difference there. Hmm, yeah, do you think you, you can it, do that on Ubuntu? You can. There are manual partitioning options. But if you if you just go next, 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 finish, yeah, you might have a bad time if you had something <laughs> that you really wanted to keep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, is it really... <sighs> I feel like I feel like the OpenSUSE installer lets you go more out of the box if you want, but if right. you're willing to stay within some certain parameters, all the installers are kind of a wash. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Wimpy, you wanted to comment on Yast. Yeah, I mean, it's been such a long time since I've installed OpenSUSE and seriously taken a look at it that Yast has actually changed considerably. I think it's been re rewritten, so that, that probably gives you an idea how long it is since I last looked at it. Mm -hmm. And I think where OpenSUSE shines is some of those Yast modules for configuring things like uh, your NIST client or authenticating with a Windows domain controller. That That's where you see the sort of yes. prize credentials coming through on the desk. And there's lots of little things like that that you don't find in the other distributions as readily. Um, certainly not so much sort of out of the box install features. So there's a lot of good stuff tucked away in Yast. It's a little bit of a mixed bag still. You know, there's some of the Yast modules are a little bit confusing to look at, and then other modules are just amazing. The 
I forget which one what it's called, but there's one that you can view your your discs and your partitions and your layouts in a in a whole load of different ways. And there's one that maps the the physical devices and the partitions to the volumes. And I just thought that was terrific, um, you know. And that actually is very useful for a new user to actually get a an easy to understand visual representation of how their data is laid out on their discs. Yeah. So I thought Yast was pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. I, I that's that's a real area where you can underscore it too. Uh, also setting up like Zen or KVM. Yep. Super, Super easy. Super easy. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. Really nice. Yeah. That that was that was really nice actually. I have yeah. To say, yeah. And then the nice good. ButterFS support with that, the virtualization. Like with, those two go hand with in Snapper hand. built in. So right. when you install a package, you're getting yeah. snapshots. I mean, it's yeah. real slick. It's yep. real slick. Yeah, Can I and just add something about the BTFS support quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, was, it was something that we kind of forgot to talk about a lot with, with Leap's release. Um, someone mentioned it already with the, the different uh, sub-volumes that we're setting up by default. Part of that is to shield stuff from snappers, so things like your home directory don't get eaten up into all those snapshots. Yeah. But we've also um, started using the non-copy and write attribute for certain key areas. So things like your database folders, uh, libvert folders, all that kind of junk, where they're going to have big files with lots of nasty I.O., you can um, still use that on BTRFS. It won't do copy on writes. The performance is, you know, ext 4 like Yeah, it really seems like uh, the benefits of OpenSUSE sort of embracing ButterFS before everybody else are paying off. I really off. appreciate that they are doing this, too, and they're show, sh- yeah. showcasing how yeah. you can't. Right? It, There's some places where it's not ready, yeah. it but is the places where it is. It is something it. I touched on specifically. I remember I spent some time talking about this on my review on the Linux Action Show, is that it is, I think, the most intelligent breakdown of sub-volumes, like uh, it was mentioned in the chat room, that Postgres has broken out, too. Another example where maybe copy on write isn't, doesn't make a lot of sense, or your virtual machines, copy on write doesn't make a lot of sense, and it is the number one thing that can hit your performance on a ButterFS file system, and so the fact that SUSE has thought about that, I think very much shows that they've been, you know, they've been trying this for a little while. And Wimpy, in that kind of sense, uh, I agree with you. It's not necessarily a new user. I mean, it can be a new user's distro, but it also can be a power user's distro, too. Yeah, I think so. I, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a an admin more more an admin than a developer i would say i think open is a is a nice distro yeah it seems like a great place to host some host some deployments yeah i yeah, wonder it, if we'll start seeing it take off in like the vps and cloud sphere as much that would really be big yeah yeah we already have some hosts already offering leaf uh, as part of the hosting packages yeah leap especially it seems like you yeah know, exactly. you kind of got the stable ish. yeah about once a year, I can handle a refresh, right? But like, I don't. Maybe yeah. I don't need to micromanage it more than right, that. But exactly. it still gets you know security stuff. Sweet and spot. Yeah, uh, Dasani, you've been using uh, Tumbleweed and Stable, uh, and they are sharing the same home directory. Tell me about that. And has it blown up in your face yet? <laughs> nope, not yet. Uh, ext4 on the home directory, is, or actually, uh, what's the one you use? Not ext4, the robust one. XFS. Yes, that one. Um, <laughs> I use XFS in the home directory, and I share. Uh, so tum- Tumbleweed can get however unstable. I know I can always roll it back, or if it, it gets corrupted, I can always kill it. But also, I have BTRFS running my the stable, um, I guess, Leap is what it's called now. And that is got all my games on it. So the kernel stays stable. The proprietary drivers, unfortunately, but... Yeah, they stay the same, and so I can play uh, Borderlands 2 on stable, and it runs beautifully. And I can, mm. if I want to play with, like, Builder, it will run beautifully as well, and I don't have to wait till next year. Yeah, that's a good point. And Wimpy, you had a great question for our Brown about uh, rolling distros. I'd love to hear it. Uh, yeah, I I saw um, the Linux voice um, voice of the masses. It was a question asking about I think it was something to do with rolling releases. I can't remember. Was it containerization? But I saw um, Richard comment on there that he had a a feel feeling that rolling release was sort of vital to the future of Linux distro at that point. Yeah, that was from one of my uh, slide decks. I have a, a lovely slide that I kind of throw in there to troll people where it says, you yeah. know, rolling releases are the future of Linux. But I do honestly believe it. I mean, if you look at the pace of, of how upstream stuff is changing, the the old distribution model just can't keep up. You know, with kernel changes, base system changes, everything's just moving too fast. Mm. And in many cases, like a lot of the 
uh, if you look at things like system D, GNOME, et cetera, you know, you, you need to move the base system in order to move the user space. So uh, long term, and I'm in, in cases of, you know, enterprise, maybe we're talking a decade from now, in other cases, maybe five years, whatever. Mm. But I, I really think uh, rolling releases, moving everything at a faster pace, and then worrying about things like integration and testing and containerization and whatever, is how we're going to see distros having to evolve because otherwise we just can't keep up we're out of date by the time we ship yeah very much i completely agree yeah i do too actually uh poppy do you want to expand on that no yeah i i, I don't really need to either i completely agree as well like i mean we just heard from the beginning of this conversation why are you shipping gnome 316 not i mean even microsoft is doing that with yeah. the new windows 10 right yeah i think i think the the new the new expectation is well i've heard about this really awesome thing on that blog and now i want it right I want it. Why can't I get it? I want it. I want it right now. And yeah, that's, yeah. So uh, that's the Linux community in a nutshell. Well, you know, it, I mean, not not to, I mean, that's sort of put in the worst light, but the reality is there is really smart people making really awesome code that's available for free that makes your life better. And yeah, you do want it. Yep. Because it makes crap easier and it makes crap better. And you don't want to have to deal with installing a whole bunch of stuff yeah. or dealing with conflicts. You just you just want it. And you know you look at XGD app and you look at Docker and you look at all these different stuff that is talking about shipping applications and containers. And it seems like uh, that's already a foregone conclusion as well. And that sort of isolates you from the uh, touch and go of a rolling release. Right. So we're kind of coming upon this uh, problem with two different solutions at the same time. And I think that Tumbleweed is a uh, you know it's a very specific, unique approach to this particular problem, and it's one that I've kind of fantasized about for years, so it's really cool to see it actually <laughs> ship. Uh, so, yeah. Anybody else, before we wrap up, have any other comments on OpenSUSE Leap or uh, things of this nature? Uh, yeah. Um, one thing that I really do like about OpenSUSE as well that I've noticed is that pretty much you could customize it from the get-go to be your own distribution yeah. with the way the software manager works and everything. You can get the network installed uh, you could click GNOME, for instance, as your default desktop. Then you can click software at the summary, and you can go in yeah. and you could say, I don't want this, but I want this, that, and that. Yeah. And then all that stuff gets uploaded there, and it's you know, you're not wasting any bandwidth or anything like that. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because that's how it used to be. <laughs> right. So you used to do it in distros. Is you yeah. check, I want the KDE desktop environment. I want the web browsing packages and all of that stuff. I can imagine the old... Debian menu right now. Right, and then Ubuntu came along, and it's like, well, we'll just pick all the best stuff for you by default, and that kind of became the trend for a while, and now now there's like, oh, well, I kind of like being able to choose. I mean, there is a, there's a middle ground right. there, too. Uh, and I was going to say, I thought what you were going to mention was the Build Studio, because that's really where you can customize. Yeah. Uh, if you guys out there are listening to episode 119 and want to share your thoughts on Leap, go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com or go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. We really do check it. Please, please we do. do. And uh, it's been interesting to see. Uh, I, I specifically think they're doing something right here, I, them being the Open Source project, because uh, without question, without question, it has gotten more and more attention in our community over the last year. And it, uh, it's got to be. It's got, I, 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 there was a point in time where we were not talking about it very much no. anymore. Uh, Open Source. It's kind of the unmentioned third player. And uh, I think this is re gearing. Uh, in a way that uh, much more matches the expectations and desires of today's Linux user. I think it's fascinating. And I think it's also something that OpenSUSE was in the best position to deliver on. Arch can't do it. They're too far into the very rolling release. Ubuntu can't do it. They've got their system. Fedora can't do it. They're trying to reform it, but they can't quite do it. And really, you look back at it now, and it almost seems like, well, yeah, of course it had to be OpenSUSE. But at the time before they made this leap... But um, bump. It didn't. You know, you couldn't see it. And now you look back and I go, oh, they're in the perfect position. They have the perfect tool set, and they're ready to go. I feel like it hits that sweet spot too, where you have people. Maybe they're in our community. They use Arch at home, but they're work. You know, at work they've got like CentOS or yeah, RHEL deployed, yeah. and they're a little like, oh, this is so old. I keep having to deploy my own conf- configure things from source because yeah. it isn't in my repo. Right. And they'll be like, when we refresh our server, what's the next thing we're using? Yeah. Maybe it's OpenSUSE. Maybe, maybe you get them. You get that live kernel patching in there. You get exactly. that. Uh, yeah. Up you know, time like, funk. Woo-wee. Woo-wee. I like that. I like that. All right. Well, uh, uh, well, okay. Last chance for any closing statements uh, from the mumble room on OpenSUSE and Leap going once. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Leap yeah, is uh, now. Just try. Oh. All right. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Leap is now being, is now tracking SUSE, which is the thing why they're calling it Leap now. So that's the thing that you can now cleanly, at least yeah. is the ambition, 
Yeah. A transition from leap to straight up Susa, if you want it. Yeah. And uh, I know there's one other person tried to jump in there. I didn't catch who it was, but go ahead. One. So, yeah, yeah uh, Gabriel. So, uh, the one of the good things I like in uh, OpenSUSE project is that we have both. Right. Stable yes. and yes. rolling together. Yeah. So, in a few clicks, I can move from uh, stable to rolling. Using zippered up, yeah, and it seems, yeah, it seems That's to be the, a very good point actually because it's the only distribution doing that, yeah. And and and, there, and, and I don't want to give the impression that you're going to have zero problems when you make that transition, like you know, your NVIDIA driver might start complaining, but it is pretty damn neat, it is pretty cool. And if that kind of stuff doesn't matter to you, it's it is an incredible ability to be able to make that switch, it is worth it is worth mentioning, uh, yeah, and uh, um. I don't think I don't think anybody else is quite doing it like this with the complete no. picture. So it's pretty exciting to see it happen, and with the pedigree that they have, that too, right? That that's also really like it's good not point. an it's not an and upstart. the brand, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yes. It's not some distro that nobody's running that won't be here in a year right. or two years, right? Yeah. yeah, very much so, very much so. Uh, yeah, uh, R. Brown, you want to make a uh, quick co comment on the migration? Go ahead. I'm curious about yeah, that. Just just, just hopping from, from leap to tumbleweed, um, when you're doing it with just the official repositories, we test that as like a standard open QA thing. So like oh, every time there's a awesome. tumbleweed update, we, we see that you can get from leap to them and back. And, and in fact, back we don't test that much, but we know Zipper does it with its eyes closed, or you can just use Snapper. So nice. you can always like that's hop over, know. try it, roll it back, and everything's wonderful. And Easy peasy. Ooh. Ooh, that's like really that. cool. That is really you cool. You almost take it for granted. You almost and do, right? We've got a few few things from the the SLE guys of some of the stuff they're slipping in their new service packs, which I'm really keen to throw into 42.2 to make that even slicker. What would it take to make that actually happen? Is it just somebody saying I'll do it, or what? Does somebody get assigned that job? How does that happen? I, that that's just going to be figuring out a few differences between how our infrastructure works and how the the enterprise infrastructure works. Because like there's things like repo metadata where they can say, okay, this release can upgrade to that release and that stuff, and we haven't got that stuff plumbed into. Does it? Our does it? Does it, does it feel yet. like? Does it feel like to you being a bit out on the edge saying? Here's the distro. It's released. Now we have thousands of people using it, but we don't actually have that particular question answered yet. Which particular question? Sorry. How 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 exactly you might take something from SLES, SUS Enterprise Linux Server, and a great feature, and move it down to to uh, Leap? Like it seems like that's going to be kind of a, a cornerstone feature of Leap, but maybe not something that's totally been figured out yet, even though. It's now out there for users. How does that, like, d does that feel sort of like, sort of like, well, we're just kind of going by the seat of our pants, and we're just going to kind of figure it out as we go because we know that's the best way to do it? Or, what? It, what is your impression sitting there in the project when you know there's real questions about how do you migrate something like that, like a piece of technology from the upstream or SLES, and push it out to push it out to leap, and you know you want to do it, and you've even kind of publicly committed to doing it, but there's not actually a process or a plan to do that thing. 99 times out of 100, um, SUSE are doing that as part of the daily job anyway. So even ah. when they're working on SLE, they, you know, engineering at SUSE work on Tumbleweed at the same time. If they're doing a new thing in SLE, I, I, in fact, I think it's still, it's still a policy in many cases where, like, their internal commit to SLE will get rejected if there isn't a matching one to Tumbleweed. Ah, wow. Okay. So, so they, you know, they, they, you know, upstream first is a, you know, a common policy in the case of leap or, or stuff like this where it, it's kind of falling through the cracks because it's not a, a, a code thing but kind of a infrastructure thing but we'll figure it out i mean it, it's in it's just a case of of timing syncing talking to each other i you know i'm sure we'll come up with a solution yeah yeah yeah, it is. It is an interesting time. Well, uh, uh, I'm glad that. Uh, thank you, everybody who showed up to, to chat about this. Thank you, R. Brown, and everybody who's been talking about this. It is really, really, really cool to see this kind of uh, see a lot more passion and interest. There's some great up. momentum here. Yeah, uh, I want to tell you about something else that's got some great passion. Ting, my mobile service provider and mobile that makes sense. Go to Linux.ting.com. Why? Because you like putting Linux in your history bar. I know you got RedTube in there and stuff like that. Now you can put Linux in your history bar. Linux.ting.com. Get twenty five dollars off your first Ting device or. $25 in service credit if you bring your own device like I did. And uh, $25 paid for my first month of Ting, right off the top. It was nuts. Ting is mobile, it makes sense, because you just pay for what you use. There's no contract, no other termination fee. Boomsies! And they even, because they hate contracts with a passion, 
will help you get out of your existing contract with their ETF relief program. I love that. That's sweet. Go to linux.ting.com right now to support this show. Keep us on the air, please. And also get yourself that discount. Take a look at some of their different devices there. They have a bunch of good stuff. And also, when you go to linux.ting.com, I want you to try out their savings calculator. Plug in your stuff and see if it makes a good sense. Yeah, you know, Literally. Does it make sense? Are you going to save some sense? Try it out. I got an email today. Uh, I wonder if he's in the chat room. I don't see him in there. I don't see him in there. But I got an email today uh, where he's like, you know, I had, a, I had a carrier charging me a ton of money. My bill was over 80 bucks after taxes. Switched to Ting, 30 bucks. Wow. Same with me. I got three lines about the same story. Right. It's really nice. Go to linux.ting.com to get started. They got two different networks, GSM, CDMA you can choose from, some more devices than ever you can bring. And uh, when you bring your own device, then it's really incredibly, incredibly valuable. But if you go to linux.ting.com, you can also get $25 off a brand new device that's unlocked. No contract. You pay for what you use. They got an awesome dashboard and really awesome customer service. And Ting's all about it. Like, they're not just about, like, you know, bucking the trend on contracts and early termination fees. They're also about like cutting the cord and all that kind of stuff. They have some great posts about cutting the cord recently and keeping the content. Cut the network, but keep the content. They got a post about that. And then you gotta go, resp- you gotta, you gotta love Kyra, right, Wes? Kyra. You gotta love Kyra. She's posting up app pics over on the Ting blog and she's got one for your faces right now. It's called Swappa. What's your phone worth? I'm Kyra and this is the Ting app of the week. Swappa is an online marketplace where you can buy and sell used devices. If you've ever wondered how much you'd get for your phone if you were to sell it, this is the app that'll tell you. While you can't buy or sell directly through the app, it's a perfect price checker and the first of its kind. Just tap to get a realistic valuation of your used smartphone. Here, you can select a specific model and view a pricing chart of your phone over its lifetime. Tap the orange circle in the bottom right to check out other devices too. You can use the search bar or sort by manufacturers and providers, like Ting. If you're thinking about an upgrade or just wondering how much you could get for your smartphone, Swap a price is worth checking out. Grab the app for free on Android. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Thank Linux. you, Kyra. Linux.ting.com. Thank you, Kyra. That's right. <laughs> Linux.ting.com. Go there and try it and support the show just by checking them out. Linux.ting.com. It's pretty cool. And those are some good apps, and we've had some previous ones before, and uh, Kyra's always... I always enjoy having Kyra come on. I wanted to have the 12 days of Kyra in December, but I, I haven't been able to make it work out yet. Yeah, but uh, I've we'll been hope. trying. We'll yeah. hope. <laughs> <laughs> Linux.ting.com. Go check out Ting. It really is mobile that makes sense. You support this show, and you finally get out of that really crappy contract where they totally own you. Linux.ting.com. Wes, I hope I am. I am so effing hoping that in a couple of weeks I'll be sitting here giving you a review of my Libre or Librem. I don't even remember anymore. Librem. Librem Prism 15. Uh, the Librem Pr- Prism 15. Purism. Rev- Purism. Purism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 15 will be uh, shipping uh, in phases. Uh, 10 pieces of light gray. What is that? 10 PCs? Really? Only 10? Well, already shipping another 10. I, either way, I should be getting my Librem or Purism or whatever it is. I can't even remember because I bought it so long ago. <laughs> Someday. I should be getting my ultimate Linux laptop soon to review. Um, this is exciting. I actually am not that super excited anymore. I was even as You don't of, even seem like you believe it's happening. I don't. Because it's been it's been delayed twice now, and I actually I needed it like the first time I got delayed. The first delay was I desperately needed a new laptop because of a work thing we were doing, and and I didn't, and I was just, and and because I like how you say work, like we don't know what it is you, you do for work. <laughs> <You're> right, <laughs> you know, like a work thing, not not this radio station. <laughs> you know, no. podcasting. Uh, I know, right? Yeah. Well, the thing the thing about it was is that I because I've, I've been I've, I've just been thinking about it, like the, my window of opportunity for needing this laptop has passed. Right. And and I I, I I kind of regret. I ain't getting an Oryx, so right. I want I that yeah, actually you just now is now I want an Oryx exactly. And I kind of regret funding this thing. Um, I mean I wanted to fund and I wanted to get behind something that was the ultimate Linux laptop, nice a MacBook competitor that you can install a bunch of distros on, had physical uh, switch buttons for the webcam and things like that. You know what though? It's gonna be uh, the end of the year soon, and uh, I've moved on. And I'm really kind of bummed that I got caught up in this. I wanted to do this for a review, and so I'm hoping that once this thing shows up, my enthusiasm returns. But at this point, at this point, it's a little. Hmm. Yeah, it really will depend on on what shows up at your doorstep and, and how you like it. I uh, Wimpy, I have not read the recent reviews. What have you seen? 
I'm not going to say. I'm going to let you read them for yourself. Oh, no. You, your own unit. Secret, secret. Uh-oh. It's not secret. If you search around, you'll find it. I just don't, don't want to go down as a purism naysayer. Despite okay. the fact well, I that am. says it. Despite the fact that I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, when you say that, I think I'm going to read the reviews and I'm going to I'm going to be disappointed. Is what I is what I'm taking away as an impression here, and I don't like that. Oh man. All right. And 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 I I don't know. Like, uh, what should I have done? Right. As the idealist Linux user, should I not have crowdfunded this? It seems like this was a good, like, honest effort to I try to fund. I think, I think you had a duty to fund it, you know, with the weight of the Linux Action Show behind you. This was a big initiative, wasn't it? It was a bold statement that yeah. Purism made. You had to back it, you had to get the equipment, and you have to review it. The thing is, is that it was a year ago that yeah. we first, yeah. when it was, you know, first tabled. And you can't know, you know, a year ago how long this crowdfunding campaign is going to take to turn into a reality. I but I think you've done the right thing in terms of, you know, covering this, you know, for the Linux Action Show, you've done the right thing. Whether or not it was the right thing for you to do personally or not, you'll be able to tell us when you get the unit and review it. Yeah, that is exactly what it is. Yeah. Either way, I think we're going to get a really good Chris Last rant. You know, I it's just I've, I've interviewed the founder and I've met him in person. Uh, I, I, I I know he even like knows which laptop is mine. Like he, he knows wow. which one is mine. And so like I'm like, okay, I, I feel like I should be excited here, but it was a year ago. And to be honest with you, it's like Wimpy said, I, I just the enthusiasm personally has dwindled and professionally I'm still interested, but yeah. I, I, are you amazed? I don't know if people can hear it in the background right here. I'm gonna turn on my microphone just for a second. Hold on. Hold on. It sounds like a fan, really, almost. Yeah, it's the wind. Are you in a plane? Yeah, it's, it's it's it is really it is really windy here. I'm amazed that we haven't been knocked offline yet. No, it's it is weird. It's really it's really windy here as well. Yeah, I know really, it is really windy. Yeah, I think actually about the same speeds. It is uh, what about what was it 110 km? Uh, yep. It was. Yeah, it was really. We do miles an hour here. You don't have to convert it. <laughs> oh, you do. Okay, all right. Very nice. Impressive. Very nice. I think we're about 60, 65 miles per hour wind here. It is really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so Absolutely. proud of myself for having the conversion. <laughs> I was. That was impressive. You've been staring at your car dial, haven't you? <laughs> no, I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll let you guys know if I get it, because they're supposed to be shipping Librem 15 uh, units uh, with dark gray coming with 4K screens. I believe mine is 1080p. You should just put this here where this Windows laptop is, just just for right. my sake, really. Right. I know. Really. I'm amazed it hasn't been deactivated yet. Nope. Yeah, it still shows the watermark. Wow, I I almost feel like I want to keep. I want. I feel like Kramer right now. I want to keep going until the power knocks us offline. I know, right? right? How long can we go? Uh, right. How I feel Love like we're, marathon. We're running, we're running on fumes right now. It's it's it's, it, it's damn impressive. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up there while we uh, so that way we can actually record the entire episode and not lose the file. That would probably be a good idea. That would probably be good because I have lost so many episodes in the past that I can't bear to lose another one. But I would love to have you join us live. Go over to jblive.tv on a Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific or go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and you get this converted to your local time zone. It's amazing. Also, I'm going to give one more plug for Rover Log 15 for our trip to System 76. I say that because right now, over on the reruns machine over there, I'm looking at 391. Hey, look at that. Live from System 76. It was, it's uh, very, it's well timed. You know, that was such a cool setup they had for us with the with the illuminated desk. And it's all. amazing, and like the nice backing wallpaper. Yeah. It looks like you're you're out well, at Hollywood. It's their booth setup, and it was super cool. And you know, <laughs> it was like all live events. It was it was down to the wire to get that work, and it was a lot of fun. But a big thank you to System76 for having us out there, too. Uh, so anyways, uh, I'll wrap it up by just saying uh, our mumble room is an open room. There's no secret password. There's no secret code you need to know. Just go over to jblive.tv, do bang mumble. You'll get the mumble server info. And then we just have uh, mods who are awesome, and I love them, and I want to give them thank kisses. Because I yelled at them today. I'm like, what the hell, guys? But no, now I'm saying I love He loves them. you. He yeah. loves you. That was in private. But in public, I say they're great. That's what I do. Uh, and you can you can uh, talk to those uh, mods, and they'll uh, check your microphone and see if you can join our virtual lug and then come in and share your opinion on stuff. LinuxActionShow.reddit.com for topics or feedback or uh, check for the thread for 119 in there. And uh, I think, is there anything else we need to cover this week, Wes? I don't think so. I think we've hit it right on the head. Mama Room, thank you guys for joining us. And of course, if there's anything we're forgetting, we'll also have the post show, which which we can chat in. Or please contribute to the subreddit. Yeah, that does really help We'll bring it right back up. Yeah, LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. 
All right. So as we are recording right now, hopefully this isn't the only show you hear because the power just went out again and if the lights so, are flickering. Welcome. Goodbye. Hello. I shouldn't everything. have said anything. I apologize. Linux Unplugged 119 is coming to an end right now while we still have power. My God, I have no idea if we're going to make it. The lights are flickering. We'll see if we're here next week. We uh, don't know. I don't know. But thank you very much for tuning in. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get live events, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for uh, all that stuff and contact slash contact for emails and slash live for the live stream. It's all slashes. Everything. Everything. Slash, slash, slash. Wow. Well, uh, hopefully this wasn't the only show we got. And thank you so much for tuning this week's episode. We really appreciate of Linux it. Linux Unplugged. And Come back next week. Yeah. <laughs> well, no power out. If we don't get blown away, we'll be here. Yep. See you then. Yeah, we were unplugged. Linux yep. unplugged was Linux unplugged. unplugged. <laughs> Even the Hughes lights got reset. Yeah. That's how you know it's bad. My yeah. connection to Quassel dropped. And, <laughs> what is this? Now, before everybody writes in and says, good at UPS, uh, listen, listen, they add line noise. Yeah. If you don't want, if you don't want in your podcast, you don't want Chris running everything on UPS. So you can fit a few in there. Otherwise, we'll have to get conditioners yeah. and yeah. it's a whole thing. Now, uh, uh, I know our friends across the pond, they probably don't have this power issue we have here in Washington where all of our power lines are above ground. Yeah, who, I mean, bury things? That's that's insane. That's nuts, right? Yeah. You can so. just string them up, you know, yes. very loosely on yeah. the side of the road. Oh, wow. That was so funny. Like, Wes and I are just sitting here looking at each other like, oh, wow, we just lost power. That sucks. Seriously? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Did you all know in the mom room immediately what happened? You all must yep. have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We are gone. It was an awkward silence. And they're gone. All right, well, we, probably, we should probably wrap up so we can get this file, but thank you guys very much. Great show. Absolutely. Uh, sorry we have to kind of rush out of here, but I don't want to lose the file. Hopefully, we have more than just this for the show <laughs> release this week. Yes. <laughs> oh, come on, Scale Engine. You have a backup. Your only hope. Chris, yes. I've got a question for yes, you. Yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. In your time in the trenches, uh, yeah. helping people move away from windows and yeah. businesses. Down in the trenches. What did you use? Uh, did you have a deal with exchange compatibility? Oh, man. That's a good question. Exchange compatibility... Was was for myself. Per- I'll tell you my personal story. Yes, personally, it was the thing that held up my conversion to Linux the longest on my work desktop computer. I can and see now, that. this goes this goes back to why I have such a soft spot for crossover Office mm. because they made it possible to not just not just be connected, but actually use a legitimate Outlook. I started with Evolution and the Exchange Data Server and all of that, Mm -hmm. and uh, it was okay, and it was my preferred way to go, but it just, um, so many times, little things didn't work right. And so for Crossover Office to come along and give me actual Outlook, even though I hated Outlook, but to give me actual Outlook. full-on Outlook. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that was such a game changer for me. Uh, And then, you know, it became less important after Office, or I'm sorry, after Exchange, um, I don't know, what they, Exchange 2003 or whatever they called it, uh, where they started to get the Outlook Web Access interface a little bit better. Yeah, right. And then it became, well, I could just use you my web, just browser. Use the web browser. And then now, now today in 2015, it is not a weird concept at all to say, well, I'll just check my mail in a web browser. Right. You right. already have Gmail in right. one tab. Right. But back in 2005, 2004, 2003, you were a maniac. Squirrel mail was like good web mail, right. and that was like what you had. Uh, and I know, you know, I tried so many times. I tried using Thunderbird and mm-hmm. LDAP and... Uh, K-mail and just so many different things I tried to use. And so uh, for me, the, the, the slow but steady march of companies failing to very often upgrade their office installation, yes. just the slow but steady pace they have there meant that wine compatibility was almost a guaranteed thing with the version of Outlook they Good were going to be using. Yeah. Right. So everywhere I went, there was almost always like, if they got to this, so what I eventually did later on is I developed like this scale. And on this on this scale, you had your, you could just use Outlook Web Access. And on the other end of the scale, you had Run Wine and Outlook, right? right. And usually in the middle was where Evolution sat, or even you know a little bit towards the uh, Use Outlook Web Mail uh, scale, Thunderbird. Sad. And so what I would normally do is I would suss up, and I'm drawing Wes a, a diagram It's here. a beautiful diagram. Yeah. Uh, I what will I would, attest to this. I would normally do is I normally found that most users sat in the Thunderbird to Outlook uh, range or in between evolution, and I would just I would actually usually just avoid evolution altogether because I found the stability to be unpredictable. I see, yeah. Now, 
Uh, every now and then you had your high ends, which had to go with your wines. Right. And then they needed know, everything. They yeah. used all those features. Yeah. And then now I think you know if I was still doing it, um, I, I would probably just have them use Outlook Web Access. Yeah. Uh, and and that would probably be fine. Why do you ask? Oh, I was just playing with a new a tool I found uh, that takes Exchange and translates it into IMAP, uh, CardDAV, CalDAV, and no. LDAP. Yeah. Now, do you have to run it on the Exchange server? Nope. Oh, no, you, can, you can either run it locally or set it up What's as like it a called? transparent What's it gateway. called? What's it called? Uh, I'm going to write DAV it mail. Okay. Yeah, so it makes it like a web dev thing. It huh? is Java, so, but uh, so you, I had no problem running so, it. They have a deb and uh, So the DAV easy. mail uh, process goes out and connects to an exchange server over what? OWA, uh, Mappy? It can use OWA and then it also uses exchange web services. Okay. So, yeah, so you're pretty much going to get even like address book lookup and stuff like yep, that. you can do address book lookup, calendar... That's I haven't tested the full suite, uh, but IMAP works really well. So your well. work uses Exchange? It does, yes. Mm, yeah. And yeah, OWA works works fine, but uh, there's some stuff where I want to set up like some scripts that can check and do right. you know email-related actions. What and... about like things like out of office? Do you have to go to the webmail to set that still, or do you know? That's a good question. Yeah. I'll have to experiment with that. Because that's always like the thing that right, was totally... Right, it's those little, yeah, those yeah, little yeah. details at the ends, hmm. yes. Yeah, Exchange, uh, you know, Exchange has gotten a lot easier in the era of smartphones right. and things like that, but... And I know, like, uh, Office 365 even has, like, a JSON API now. So if you go that far, wow, then, wow. then it gets better. It was really, though, back, like you say, back when I was in the trenches, it was really that thing, you know, I'm, I, and I'm specifically reflecting on Exchange 5.5, Exchange 2000, and Exchange 2003, and just right. watching that, watching how they had, Microsoft had such a brilliant lockdown. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. It's all just one it big was, thing. It was really an Active Directory solidified all of it, yep. right? And, and it worked well enough. I mean, for yeah. the things it did, it just... It was, it was actually... Active Directory was perfect because uh, what it was, was it was, a, it was it was a significant, significant organizational improvement over NT4 right. and that paradigm. And it was it was much more in line with uh, NetWare's uh, eDirectory mm-hmm. and others. And only... It managed to not only make organizationing more more streamlined, but it also it could accommodate like acquisitions and mergers that businesses faced. Sure, you right. Know? And that so, was something supported. Yeah, you understood it, how to do yeah, that. exactly. Like you could actually figure out how to do acquisition mergers with other companies and integrate them into your Active Directory, which was you know for the business world that's a big deal. Yeah, right. And then on top of that, on top of that, they they managed to like if you're going to go Active Directory, well then you have to have a Windows DNS server. Yep. And if you're going to go Active Directory, you should probably do DHCP on a Windows server because that DHCP server will automatically dynamically update the DNS yes. entries, which oh, is I've been important. playing with that at work as well. Right. Hey. Which is important for Active Directory to function correctly. Right. And so, and if you're going to go Active Directory, you might as well go Exchange because that's going to tie into all your user accounts and that'll make single sign-on possible. And if you're going to go Active Directory, you might as well go IIS on your intranet server because then you can use single sign-on for your intranet as well. And yeah, we'd prefer to use Apache, but single sign-on's a big deal. We don't want users to have to enter passwords, so we'll go. We'll go IIS here, <laughs> and it's such a brilliant way to lock you in. But it's totally the old model, right? Yep. And 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 it doesn't really apply anymore. And Yak Directory is still huge and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, it just is such. It was such a stroke of genius on Microsoft's <laughs> part, right? When Windows was going to be everywhere. Yes. Yeah, that was that was something. And and now today, Active Directory can just simply be a service on Azure. Yes. It's and uh, you know the LDAP integration and that so, kind of stuff in Linux. So you've been playing with DHCP and uh, dynamic updates. Oh, just uh, there's a Windows component to our network, and just just yeah. playing with the living on yeah. Linux in that environment. You know, it was I I remember when Bind actually uh, I don't remember it was Bind nine or I, I can't remember when Bind got it, but I remember when dynamic DNS came to Bind, right? And I could deploy a Bind server again on my network and have it dynamically update the DNS on a Windows server. Yeah. And uh, I didn't expect I don't remember exactly the nature of the improvement, but I didn't expect an improvement, a noticeable improvement. What I expected was essentially no change at all from my point of view or the end user's point of view. I didn't really think moving to bind would... would, I swear to God, Wes, there was an actual performance improvement in DNS resolution across all of the users. The way we worked is we had uh, 110 terminal servers that I was responsible for sitting in one room. And so all of your users across 40 plus branches come into one room and then they're hitting everything at once. When they log in across all, you know, you have 700 users that log in in one spot on one LAN all at once. It it really hits it, right? Yeah, definitely. Especially back in the day when, you know, things were, you know, crappy processors and stuff like that. And we didn't have SSDs and any of that kind of stuff. So if you're going to have any kind of disk I.O. It's a massive SCSI RAID array, and it's a monster to manage. Oh, and so geez. when Bind came along, just that small, I mean, Bind was around way longer than Windows DNS, but when Bind dynamic updates came along that interrupted with Active Directory, when that happened, 
you could actually witness, like you could sit there and see desktop logins happen faster, name resolution happen faster. And I, That's amazing. It was just like, wow, is everything better under Linux? Like yep. everything? <laughs> I was at DockerCon in Barcelona this week. Oh, really? Tell me about that. Tell us more. Yeah, man, it was good. But um, the most surreal moment of the entire conference was listening to a Microsoft rep giving a talk, stood there in a red hat hat oh. <laughs> about open source and how great Linux was on Azure. Whoa, that's weird. I don't so know how I'd feel what, about what that. What was the what was the what was the scene like at DockerCon? Is it does it feel like a lot of money was spent, or does it feel like a new startup thing that's struggling to seem big, or did it feel like it's arrived? Like, what was your vibe? You walked away from DockerCon. Such a great community. The DevOps community has such a nice energy around it. Um, it was a big conference, about two thousand people, um, and there was food everywhere you went, and there was free beer which obviously is great in Spain. <laughs> and, yeah, it was it was a really great experience. Um, definitely recommend going if you can. And they've announced that the next DockerCon in June will be in your neck of the woods, Chris, in Seattle. No. Oh, cool. Wes, we should go. We should definitely go. Hmm. Well, you, you know what? I'm going to look into that. I'm going to, hmm, that's, a, that's an interesting. I've been, I've, been, uh, I've been thinking about scale this year. So I've been thinking about different conferences. I Just think, toying with it. I think we're not going to do scale this year, which is ridiculous because it's one of the largest Linux conventions. But, you know, Noah and I were talking about it on this trip to System76, yep. and we honestly, there's like, there's like a threshold where they start to get too big and they get corporate. Right. And... Yeah, then it's more like an industry convention rather than like a user. And Scale's really walking think, that line. I think Docker is is going to head that way fast. Yeah, yeah I mean, it feels like that. Ten years ago, you were mad if you ran a VM in production, right? Right. And now you're mad if you don't. And right. And I suspect that Docker will go that way much faster because yes. people will adopt, note the trends faster the, the econo- like You know, we're going to talk about it, uh, but the economies of scale that Docker offers is just... I mean, it, it is like, it's impossible for your, your CTOs to ignore. Right. It's just too attractive. You mean we don't have to buy new hardware? Right. What, <laughs> Keep that what, CapEx so, down. <laughs> they they the showed a switching. few cool demos, right? One of them was um, they managed their Docker containers in Minecraft. So your kid <laughs> might like that, Chris. No kidding. That's um, wild. Uh, Dylan. And um, another one they, they showed was a thousand node cluster on AWS deploying... Um, 50,000 containers in 52 minutes. Whoa, 50,000. Imagine the DDoS mm. you could start up with. <laughs> oh, no kidding. <laughs> and the only reason they stopped at 1,000 nodes was because that's all the EC2 would let Docker have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? That's great. That is. That must have been quite the, interta- the, the demo. Yeah, it got, um, it got Apple-style applause. 